5.3. The definite integral. So, the definite integral you're going to see is related to the uh, indefinite integral or the antiderivative, and it's got very similar notation. So, when looking at its notation, what we'll see is it says the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Now, this thing is still called your integral sign. This is your lower li your lower limit of integration, lower limit of integration. Uh, this is your upper limit of integration. And uh, this dx here, this tells you your x is the variable integration. And uh, f of x right here f of x is the function of integration or the integrand. The function is called the integrand. All right. So what we're going to notice in a minute here is that this uh, this definite integral is uh, is related to an infinite sum. So let's see. Two, 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 two. Okay, so so there's two ways to look at an infinite sum. So one we actually had was. Um, the area under the curve was equal to um, the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation from k equals 1 to n of f of um, x sub k or c sub k. I was writing it at x sub k times your change in x. Now the book likes to write this as c sub k, so it's it it it, it doesn't matter. So, so if you want to if you want to write that as as c sub k and make it match the book, not a big deal. Um, another way we can actually look at it is um, what we know is that that this represents you know we have an area under the curve that's going to say from a to b, and when n goes to infinity, we're taking not just you know. Uh, we're taking this discrete number of rectangles, but we're making a bunch of them. We're making an infinite amount of them. So what's going to happen is if you make an infinite amount of them, what it's going to do is it's just going to fill in that curve. So it's actually the area under it. So you can think of it as having an infinite amount of rectangles, or you can say that this is the limit as the magnitude of the partition drops down to zero of the summation from k equals 1 to n of f of c sub k times your change in x. And they say change in x sub k, and the reason why they have a little k on there is because your widths don't always have to be the same. You could have different widths for every single one, but but um, we always just made them the same just to make it um, easier to calculate. Uh, so the reason why we have a partition being equal to zero is as you get more rectangles, the width of these rectangles are becoming zero. So what this really represents is p is the width of the rectangle. So the magnitude of p represents the width of um, a rectangle. So if the width of the rectangle is going down to zero, it's the same thing as saying an infinite amount of rectangles. So the more rectangles, the skinnier they become. So finally, uh, what we're going to notice is that the area under the curve can be also found by this definite integral. So this is actually equal to the integral, the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. And you can kind of see this notation um, 
here, here, and here really kind of looks the same. So this, this infinite sum is really where this s actually comes from. This s represents an infinite sum. So the infinite sum, so the infinite sum, which is right here, and then we have um, then we have f of c sub k, so this f sub, of c sub k becomes the f of x. And then finally the last part, which is your variable of integration, your change in x is, you know, your change in x, your dx. So all those three pieces are, are still there. So the infinite sum can be represented as a definite integral. So, um, theorem. Uh, this is the existence of a definite integral. The, it's just messy. The existence of a definite integral. So a continuous function is integrable, which means it has a definite integral. That means um, <laughs> that means if it's uh, if it's continuous on the closed interval, then then um, then the definite integral exists. So. A continuous function is integrable. Uh, another theorem. These are our rules. Do I have enough room with this? I don't. Ah, right, whatever. I'll just I'll just continue. So, um, when f and g are integrable. on this closed interval a to b, then the following are true. So one, order of, uh, order, no, order of integration, so order so the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to negative the integral from b to a of f of x dx. So we go from lower to upper to make sure. So um, um, A starts, B is last. So first A, then B. When we, when we say that, so the integral from A to B. Uh, the zero width. Interval. Interval. So this says the integral from zero to zero. That's not right. Well, it's not wrong, but the integral from, I mean, the integral from a to a, from any number to itself of f of x dx is equal to zero. So I can remember what the integral actually represents. Since the integral is equal to the area of the curve, so, if I, so remember that for it to be, to be integrable, it's got to be continuous from a to b. So this is going to be equal to a and this is going to be equal to b. So this area underneath that we've been calculating for quite some time, the integral, the area from a to b, this area, we found it by hand using the infinite sum, but we're going to see that we can just do this using the definite integral, and you're going to love it. It's so much easier. So the area of the curve, this is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So if I went from a to a, it's got no width. So if it's got no width, it's got no area. So that's why that's the case. Three, um, constant multiple. So it says the integral from a to b of k times f of x dx is equal to k times the integral from a to b of f of x dx which is something we've been doing with limits and derivatives and summations and, and now integrals. Sum and difference. The 
the integral from a to b of f of x plus g of x dx is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g of x dx. So again, limits, derivatives, summations, now integrals. Actually, what you're going to notice is since the definite integral is related to the uh, infinite sum, that these are going to share all the same rules as the summations, so they're actually inherited from the summations. So it also works for minus, so you can actually do a subtraction if you wanted to as well, and then you'd have a common subtraction. Uh, 5, add it to the bd. So um, what this says is the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from b to c of f of x dx is equal to the integral from a to c of f of x dx. And uh, to show you, I'm going to um, get some more function in here. So say this function goes to there. And this new value, arbitrary, but new value over here is C. So that means we have a new area. So um, this area right here, well, let's do it in blue. So this area. Right here. That would be the integral from B to C of f of x dx. And what's nice is um, if you add these two pieces up, you're going to get that entire area. So why even stop at B? That means you can go all the way from A to C. So that's going to be the integral from A to C of f of x dx. Min and max. So we want to call it. So if f has. So if f. Come on now. So if f has a max, and we'll call it. Um, uh, max of f, max of f, and a min, we'll call this um, min of f, then then um, the integral, where would we have it? Uh, I can do this. So then uh, b minus a, the min of f multiplied by b minus a is going to be less than or equal to the no, I forgot where that was less than or equal to um, the integral from a to b of f of x dx, which is going to be less than or equal to the max of um, of f multiplied by that same interval from b to a. So uh, let's use let's use what we have up here again. So I'm going to kind of get rid of some of these colors. So if we have an integral that goes all the way, say, to A to B, so we'll call that B now. I know that the red shaded area represents the, the integral all the way from A to B. So um, this function has a minimum and it has a maximum. Its minimum value is right here. That's its minimum value, and we know how to find those. And uh, what I know is if I do uh, the minimum value times b minus a, this minimum value, which is right here, which is this value right here, and if I multiply it by b minus a, what you're actually finding is the area of this blue box. Now, the function also has a maximum value, and that maximum value is going to be up here. This is its maximum value. I'll use a different color, but I'm kind of out of them. A maximum value and uh, if I if I multiply the max of f times b minus a what I'm actually getting is this bigger rectangle it's way up here this is the big rectangle I'm trying my best not to make it too messy what you will notice is that the integral underneath the curve 
is going to be bounded by the lower box and the bigger box, that the, that the area is going to be between those two areas. So the idea is the smallest the area could possibly get would be the smallest box, and that would happen if you had a horizontal line. If the function was just this blue horizontal line right here. Or I guess I made a green by accident, but this, this blue horizontal line right here. Then the box and the area would be the, the same, but if uh, the function was this upper horizontal line, then it would just be equal to it. So no matter what, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be bounded by the smaller box and the upper box. That this, this function in the middle is going to be bounded by those. And the last thing is number seven. Last thing is it's uh, called domination. It is. I can't, little buddy. Mom will do it in a second, okay? If f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, Ava, please be quiet, okay, honey? I'm I'm recording. If f of x is greater than g of x for all x, then what I can guarantee is that um is that the integral from a to b of f of x dx is going to be greater than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x dx. Which kind of makes sense. If you have a bigger function, you're going to have, you know, if your function is larger, which means it has a larger y values for all of them, then the area of the curve is going to be bigger. Which is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. These things are positive. Now, uh, that's not true. Why did, I, why did I say that? Oh, my bad. Let me erase that. That's not true. That's only true as if, um, if f of x is always greater than zero, then you're always going to positive. But it is possible you get a negative uh, you get a negative integral, and I'll explain why that happens. All right. So I guess before we practice these rules, let's. I want to make sure not to forget to show you a couple of the examples that look like the book. It uh, asks you to. Um, Example would be express as a definite integral. And it should have happened before I showed you all those rules because it would have made more sense. But um, A, if I say what's the limit as the partition goes down to zero of the summation from k equals 1 to um, n of 2 times c sub k cubed times your change in x sub k. Well, um, what they're trying to get you to understand is that we've already done this by hand, except we had limit as we had limit as x goes to infinity there instead, but we know it means the same thing. So this is the same thing as the definite integral from a to b. Of, oh, actually, they they told us a um, they did tell us, and I forgot to write something else. So this is going to be on on an interval interval from negative 1 to 4. So our solution, which is going to be writing it as a definite integral, so express as a definition, uh, express as a definite integral. So this is equal to the integral from a to b. Remember, this is a and this is b, so it's going to go from negative 1 to 4. This um, limit of that summation becomes that integral part this piece right here and that 2c sub k cubed is going to become um 2 remember what c is the c is um just your x sub k so it's just x cubed and then your change in x the change in x becomes dx so there's your function and there's your change in x so it's really it's really straightforward this infinite sum this infinite sum becomes your integral uh, the 2c sub k cubed becomes 2x cubed, and then your um, change in x becomes your dx. So uh, b, what if I do the limit as the partition? I don't know why they change it. Partition goes to 0, as opposed to n goes to infinity. 
I like the end goes to infinity more because we just did it. And this is going to be, say, the square root of um, 9 minus c sub k squared uh, times your change in x sub k. So um, this is going to be equal on, uh, let's say, uh, minus 3 to 3. So this is going to be equal to the integral from minus 3 to 3 of, remember that integral comes from this part, then your square root of 9 minus c sub k squared, so x squared, and then your dx. All right, now we're going to use those rules that we talked about just a second ago. So example, using the rules of definite integrals, or four definite integrals. So um, we're going to suppose f and h are integrable. And their definite integrals are going to be from 2 to 4 of f of x dx is equal to 5. Um, the integral uh, from 4 to 7 of f of x dx is equal to 3. And the integral from 2 to 4 of h of x is equal to, let's go, minus 1. Now, I did say they could have negative integrals, and what that would happen is if the, if the curves if the curves underneath the function and you calculated this area here, what it would spit out is it would spit out a negative area because it's below the x-axis, because f of x is negative. So it is possible to have a negative definite integral. You just have to know what that means. All right, so... Um, uh, determine the following... A, um, what is the integral from minus 4 to 2 of f of x dx? This would do uh, one at a time. And, um, I guess I got to be two. B, what is the integral from, um, from 3 to 3 of f of x dx? C, what is the integral from 2 to 7 of f of x dx? And um, D, what is the um, integral from 2 to 4 of 3 f of x minus h of x dx? Okay. So this is equal to um, minus. Kristen, can you turn that down a bit? So I know that um, 4 to 2 is minus the integral. So what we have looking at these rules So what I know is when you, when you um, have different limits of integration, when you switch them, what you do is you introduce a negative sign. So that's this rule right here. So uh, we want this one. So this is going to be, so from 4 to 2 is going to be minus the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx, which is going to be negative. Now remember that this area right here, is equal to this to 5. So this is going to be negative 5. Uh, the integral from 3 to 3 of f of x dx. Now if you're looking up here, I don't see any 3's as far as your limits of integration, but notice that you go from 3 to itself. So what it means is you're integrating over, uh, over a 0 width interval, so the total area is going to be equal to 0. 
Now, the integral from 2 to 7. Uh, well, I see I have the, from f of x, I have the integral from 2 to 4. And I also have the integral from 4 to 7 of f of x dx. So the integral from 2 to 7 of f of x dx should be equal to the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx plus the integral from 4 to 7 of f of x dx. That this represents just the interval from 2 to 4. This is the interval from 2 to 4. This would be the interval picking back up at 4 going all the way to 7. So this is going to equal all the way from 2 to 7. So remember what that means is we go from 2 to 4 and then we went from 4 to 7. So if my function looks like this, this part right here is this. This part over here would be this one. So then the total area would be what's over here on the left. So I know that this is equal to, well, I know the first area, this is equal to 5. I'll write the numbers in here. So this is 5 right here. It's equal to 5. Now from 4 to 7, that is equal to 3. So that means the total area is going to be 5 plus 3, which is equal to 8. Now, um, this really is using the linearity rules of, uh, of summations, that the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. So you can go from 2 to 4 of 3 times f of x dx uh, minus the integral from 2 to 4 of h of x. So the integral of the difference is the difference of the integrals. And the last thing you can do is you can pull out constants. So 3 times the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx minus the integral from 2 to 4 of h of x dx. Now you can make substitutions. You know the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx, this value is equal to that, uh, that 5, so that's 5. And then you know that this value of h of x is over here, it's equal to negative 1. So 5 minus a negative 1, which would be equal to 6. All right, so so determine the definite integral geometrically. So what I'm going to first do is, uh, we'll do two examples A. What's the integral from um, from 1 to 4 of 2x dx? And then we're going to come up with a, uh, a shorthand version for, um, for constants and uh, quadratics and linears. So, um, well, let's, let's do a picture here. Remember what this represents is this represents an area in the curve, and that curve is, is 2x, so our integrand is 2x. So we're taking the, um, the area underneath that curve. So 2x looks like, uh, well, it looks like this. So this would be 2x. Now I'm finding the area that goes all the way from 1 to 4. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So the area I care about is right here. So I'm looking for this area. Now, um, there are uh, two different ways you can do this. Is, uh, is This is a trapezoid. So it's the average of these values multiplied by the height. So Technically, this is a trapezoid on the side because usually your parallel sides are run horizontally. Or you can um, you can do it by uh, triangles as well. You know, you can find this big triangle that goes down to zero zero and then subtract off this little tiny triangle here. But what I know is um, this is a trapezoid, and uh, if we have a trapezoid that looks like this, this is like your general trapezoid that you'd see like on the internet and they'd have a dot 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 they'd call this H. 
and they call this B1 and they call this B2. So um, the area is equal to um, B1 plus B2, that should be a 2, I don't know if you can read it, B1 plus B2 divided by 2, and then you would multiply by H. So our B1 and B2 are right here. This is going to be B1. Down over here, this is going to be B2. And then this distance right there would represent H. So our area is going to be equal to, well, B1. The way you find B1 is you find this height here. So what this is is plugging this into here. This, this value is going to be um, the function evaluated at 4. So this is going to be um, 2 times 4. That was messy. I can do better than that. So it's equal to 8. Because we're plugging in 4 into this function. Now for this one, I have to plug in 1. So that means this is going to be 2 times 1. So this is going to be equal to 2. So that means my area is going to be, well, base 1 is 8 plus base 2 is 2, all divided by 2, multiplied by the height, which is, well, my height is going to be 4 minus 1. So this is going to be 4 minus 1, because that's how I'm going to find the height, is I'm going to subtract 4, 1 from 4. So this is 10 over 2, so this is 5 times 3, this is 15. Now, there's other ways you can do it, but it's a trapezoid. I find that probably the easier way to do it. B. All right, so I'm going to draw a picture of this. So what I know is I'm going to go from uh, 1, 2, 3... Four, five, six, seven. So I'm going to go from 3 to 7, and then my function is just 5. So my function is 5, which is a horizontal line at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's this. That is y is equal to 5. So if I want to find that area um, that goes from 3 to 7, I want to find this area. Well, this is just a rectangle. So I know that that. Um, this area is going to be represented by the, the height times the width. So this is going to be 5 multiplied by 7 minus 3. So it's 5 times 4, which is 20. And then one more, see. The integral from minus 3 to 3 of the square root of 9 minus x squared dx. All right, um, let's investigate y is equal to the square root of 9 minus x squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of square this and make it look like something that's a little more recognizable. So when I square it, I get y squared is equal to 9 minus x squared. And when I add x squared to the other side, I get x squared plus y squared is equal to 9. And I'm not sure how long ago it's been for you, but in high school, we learned about circles. And what I notice is this is a circle uh, centered at 0, 0 with a center of 0, 0. And it's got a radius that's equal to the square root of 9, which is equal to 3. So um, now the positive root, because technically uh, if, I, if I track this back up and solve for y, if you went backwards, you'd get plus or minus here if you went the other way. So that means that we had the plus and not the minus. So um, this represents the entire circle, but the positive root only represents the top half of the circle. So technically what we're talking about is a circle of radius 3, but the positive root is only the top half of it. So we're talking about this right here. If this was, if this was negative, it would be the bottom half of the circle. But we can't do a plus or minus because it wouldn't be a function. You're going to have two outputs for every input, and it would not be a function. It failed the vertical line test, so... That's why uh, we do one or the other. So I need to find this area. Well, this is a semicircle. So um, remember the area of a circle. The area of a circle is pi r squared. So the area of a semicircle or a half circle is one half pi r squared. So that's what my area is going to be. So this is going to be one half pi, and I know my 
my radius is equal to 3, so 3 squared. So this is going to be 9 pi over 2. So this whole section is to explain what these things are. And, um, and now we can find them geometrically. Um, in the next section, we're going to come up with a basic rule to be able to find all of them. So they give us a couple um, they give us a couple formula in order to find some uh, uh, definite integrals. So um, let's do I'm gonna call it one. I might not be labeled the same as theirs, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it this way. So the integral from a to b of a constant times dx, we just did this in exercise B. This is equal to C times B minus a. Uh, 2, the integral from a to b of x dx. And this is going to be equal to um, b squared over 2 minus a squared over 2. And 3, the integral from a to b of x cubed dx. I lied, x squared dx. is going to be equal to um, b cubed over 3 minus a cubed over 3. And really where this is coming from, and this is kind of just a quick hint, so you don't have to mem you don't memorize these things, you've already, you already know them. So if I asked you what's the antiderivative of x squared dx, what this is is this is x cubed over 3, and what we can see is we see that kind of there. So what you do is you're, you're going to, what you're going to do is, uh, this is b and this is a. So what you do is you're going to evaluate this from a to b. So it means you're going to plug b in first and then plug in a next. So your b is going to go here first and then your a is going to go there next and you're going to subtract those two values. Same thing with like the integral from a to b of, um, of x dx. We know that its antiderivative is x squared over 2. So that's where you can see these, see the the squares over twos, so you're going to evaluate from a to b. So when you plug in b, you get um, b squared over two. Subtract when you plug in a, you get a squared over two. So I'm kind of showing you the fundamental theorem of calculus that's coming in the next section, but this is where they're actually coming from. So you don't have to memorize these formulas. We're going to uh, we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus pretty soon. So these are our formulas that, that we're going to use. So let's just use the formulas so we can get this the, the section how it's done. So, um, sorry, good idea. so, um, A, the integral from two to five of, um, of seven X. All right, so what I know is I know that I can pull out constants. So the integral from 2 to 5 of x dx. So what I know is this is going to be 7 times, and the formula for this is remember that the integral of x is x squared over 2. So it's going to be 5 squared over 2 minus 2 squared over 2. So this is your b, and this is your a, and that's that formula. So 7 times 25 over 2 minus 4 over 2. So 7 times 21 over 2. Uh, fourteen. What should be one forty-seven? Yeah, one forty-seven over two. And one more. So the answer to this, and we're going to have to work it out, is um, the integral of the sum of the difference is the sum of the difference of the integrals. So the integral from 0 to 4 of 3x squared dx minus the integral from 0 to 4 of 2x dx plus the integral from 0 to 4 of 8 dx. 
Now, just like what we were looking for with the, with the summations is I'm only looking for x squareds and x's and constants. So that means I'm going to pull out all these constants. So 3 times the integral from 0 to 4 of x squared dx minus 2 times the integral from 0 to 4 of x dx and then plus um, 8's already a constant, so we're done. Integral from 0 to 4 of 8 dx. Now we know the rules. This is going to be 3. And um, remember the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. So it's going to be 4 cubed over 3 minus 0 cubed over 3. Minus 2. Remember the antiderivative of this is x squared over 2. So it's going to be 4 squared over 2 minus 0 squared over 2. And then for this one, remember the integral of this is 8 times x. So it's going to be 8 times, well, when you have x, you're going to plug 4 in there and then 0 in next. So it's just 8 times 4. And um, then we're done. And I'm not going to go any further. You guys can use. Uh, you guys can. You guys can find the exact answer, or simplify. I should say.